question. There was witchcraft, there was secret combinations. What I mentioned in my book is a heinous manipulation. And to be able to look at him and see he wasn't the same man that I knew, it was too much of ego mm -hmm. and not enough of being a servant of the Lord and what would thou have me do? There are people rising up now and just because you're native or just because you are this person and you claim to be this person and you see that it coincides with, with last days, then we all of a sudden want to jump in, hook, line, and sinker. This could be the great downfall. I've walked through the darkness before. He is literally the savior of this world because he saved me. Yeah, my name is Janelle Murphy, and that's that's what it is on the book. Um, we're talking a little bit about um, walking through the doomsday darkness as I've seen it. I was born and raised in Utah. My father is from Arizona. He came on the placement program when he was eight years old and met my mother in Mapleton. And so I've just had that background of the LDS background and a little bit of the, the native background from my father's side. And so um, that's just a little bit about what I, I put in my book. Awesome. And your father is Navajo, Danae. Yeah. And your mother is, um, I know that's where you get your Czech heritage from. Is that right? Oh, it's actually, um, father's side? actually Scottish. 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 Yeah. I, I was married to a, a gentleman who was Czech. Czech. So. Okay. You, yeah. you're always baking Scottish and English. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying the things you bake are amazing. And I just, oh, thank you. <laughs> Like you must be from the Czech Republic. Somebody from your family is Czech. <laughs> Somebody. There's got to be some back there somewhere. Somebody. <laughs> Bohemia for sure. I've looked in that and there's Bohemian back there. So That's kind of the same thing. I love <laughs> so it. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to be married to somebody who spoke at preparing a people conferences. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So yeah, so you you've got lots of experiences and knowledge to pull from. Um, I want to show everybody the cover of your book right here. It actually just arrived yesterday at my house. So I have not had a chance to read the whole thing, but I have read parts of it that I thought we would talk about today. And yeah, there it is, Walking Through the Doomsday Darkness as I've Seen It. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds okay. good. Okay, so tell, tell us, uh, what inspired you or motivated you to write this book and tell your story? I think it was probably because of my own healing. Like I, I knew Chad and a lot of the people who were involved in this case. And they were friends of mine at one point. And because I was married to somebody who was in their, um, the conferences, I knew a lot of them. And so there were things that I questioned a lot but there were things that I wondered why they were the way they were and then when Lori's case came out and I saw all the evidence and they were bringing things to light that I actually didn't know um, more in depth than what the FOIA docs and stuff had said that I had read or been exposed to um, it really really bothered me it really bothered my spirit and um, really bothered my mental capacity, I, I guess you could say, because these were were people that I thought were my friends, but yet doing things behind the scenes that I didn't even know until the trial came out. And so I just feel like it, it's my voice and my experiences. And if anybody can benefit from it at all or have an understanding because I know there's a lot about this case. My intention is for healing, if that could be. So it's just the physical and spiritual side of this case. I know there's going to be many people that will write. Um, there's a juror that has written a book. There's, you know, there's a lawyer that's written on it, but mine is the spiritual side of, of this and kind of like the downfall of what I've seen or actually what I have experienced. Um, I feel like because I have experienced um, being excommunicated from the church and knowing what that feels like, I have seen that that downfall or that process um, through, through Chad and Lori. So I point that out a little bit in my book and it's more about the spiritual side of things. So 
Okay. That's what I, I was going to ask next. Um, so I was going to say the title that you chose, you kind of just summed it up right there. The way you experienced it, it was walking through doomsday darkness with everything that you saw. Could you touch a little bit on your experience? You said you were excommunicated. I did read that in the book. It, was that in connection with your story or was that completely something? No, that was like, I'm 54 years old now and it was in my 20s. So I had actually went through that process before. And then um, when I was married to my first husband, I, I came back into the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's kind of like, I know what it feels like and have seen the signs of what it feels like to have a spiritual descent. Mm -hmm. But I feel like what I've seen with Chad and Lori and others, it's they have thought that they were doing things in a spiritual way positively but behind the scenes there was that negative dissent that um was very obvious when a lot of the stuff came out yeah I could relate to a lot of this so I haven't read the whole thing yet but I'm going on a trip soon so I'll have plenty of time <laughs> to read the whole book but as you were talking about some of these experiences and some of these people and I won't I won't mention names other than the obvious um, I, I knew who you were talking about. I did have a lot of experiences back in the day with a lot of these groups and these people. And so I knew what you were talking about. I could see it in my mind. Some of these conferences you mentioned, I was there. So I, mm -hmm. I could see it all in my mind. I and remember I, meeting you at one of the conferences. That's where I met you. That's what you probably say. That's how we met. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we met. Correct me if I'm wrong. It was the Book of Mormon Conference here in Layton, Utah, where I live. Yes. That yes. is the one. I remember that. I met you. <laughs> and we've kind of been Facebook friends ever since. And that's how I found out about your book as you had posted it. I saw this come up and I thought, oh my goodness, I've got some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, um, and I've touched on this before, but I, I have a connection to Chad because he was my publisher. He published my very first book, How to Date Your Spouse. And so I've known him, that was clear back in 2008. So I've known him since then. And then after the falling out of his publishing company, I kind of disassociated myself with him, but would have run-ins at conferences where I'd see him and he would come talk to me. And a lot of things that you shared from, from things you observed, just listening to him or interacting with him, I had those same thoughts and feelings. So it's, it's interesting. It makes me wonder how many other people picked up on those uh, red flags, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. you've talked to a lot of people over the years and since the trial who have kind of related and just thought, you know, what, I noticed that too, or I just had an interesting feeling something didn't seem right. And that was my experience. So for the sake of time, I thought we would probably not talk about the trial in this interview, but focus more on just the red flags, the things that you notice and the things that you've learned so that if there's someone out there watching this video, it could help them possibly avoid an experience like this. Or if they're in an experience similar to this, it, it, it can, uh, I guess, offer them hope and ways to navigate that. You talk about in the book, you've changed the names. So are you okay using their names in this interview, Chad and Lori? Or do yeah. you want, okay, we're okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I just thought I don't want, because... I was at the trial. I, I will have to say a little bit of this. And I know that uh, Chad's lawyer saw me in that trial and was gave me like really dirty looks. It was better for me to put different names in there. So the names that I do have in there that are, are the right names are the ones that I got permission to use. So okay. the okay. others, they were not. And for legal purposes, that's why I have done that. So okay. that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell me just a little bit about your relationship with Chad. I know you mentioned in the book, you didn't really know Lori. You didn't really mm -hmm. talk with her, interact with her, but you did know Chad. Um, do you want to just share a little bit about that? Yeah, I met Chad at some of the conferences. It was probably the Book of Mormon conferences. I was actually reading his book. A friend of mine had given me some of the books and I had lived in Springville at the time. And so I kind of was in a place of discovery for me. I was in a place where I needed a lot of healing done and, and I was just spiritually open to things. And so the things of the last days I had an interest in. 
And so I had read his books and kind of got interested just in the storyline and imagined what things could be like. And then a little bit later, as I attended the conferences, then that's where I met him at. And then that's where I, I listened to him speak. He seemed a little awkward to me when he spoke. And I, I didn't say anything to anybody. That was just my own personal impression. And then as I listened to him speak a little bit more, he talked about Tammy and how um, she was the love of his life. And yet there was no smile on his face. There was nothing that showed that that she was. And so I had just really felt like that was a red flag right there. Then his sister-in-law, Heather Daybell, had talked about that. And I totally understood where she was coming from because that was the same impression that I got was that, wow, he really sounds bored in his marriage is what I thought. Yeah. And so there were just little red flags along the way. I just felt like they felt like they were part of an elite group, that they were supposed to do something great. And I think there's a lot of them that bought into that, that they were supposed to do something great, but it was under the guise of some very negative evil things and what I what I mentioned in my book is a heinous manipulation because it is a heinous manipulation for all those who are involved I think the most important thing that I have learned from this is that we really need to use the gift of discernment mm -hmm. and we need to stay close to our heavenly father our creator I call him my creator in the book I think it's very important I have seen through my experiences that you can't just go buy something and feel good about it. You need that relationship with your creator and you need to be asking and verifying things because things can sound good and they can feel good, but we need to be stepping up our game and we need to have that relationship with our heavenly father creator so that we can be safe because that's one of the things that I have learned through this whole thing is having that relationship and getting things verified, going on those red flags really and not ignoring those, knowing that there's something going on, but keeping that relationship open mm -hmm. and getting things verified through the spirit. That is so very important. I think if a lot of them did that with this case, it wouldn't have happened to where it would, but they didn't have the integrity or somehow they were blinded to think that they were better than than who they actually were that they were special that they were in this elite group and you know what all of us are special yeah. all of us can can um we don't have to be told that we were somebody great in a different life because this life is the the time that we have to be who we are and to make a difference here I and so <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true you know we all should feel special and we all should realize that that we get to talk to our heavenly father and he listens to us and he verifies things for us but I've noticed that a lot of this that's coming out especially with this case or different things that are coming out sometimes even in the LDS community, something's all a buzz and you get this next popular person, yeah. you know, that's all over YouTube or this way and that way. It's like we have the tendency as, as human beings to follow people and to admire people and to put them up on pedestals. And this could be the great downfall that we have because yeah. we really should be following our creator and yeah. listening to the spirit. And it's more imperative to do that now than any other time. Yeah. How I feel about that and my experience. Yeah. So now I know why I felt inspired to interview you. You, you just you just answered my next eight questions in that <laughs> one paragraph. <laughs> so, like that was huge. That's you know what it's it's I was gonna touch on that. I was gonna say it seems like things happen in waves. And it's the next, when somebody finally falls and we have this falling out and all these people come forward and say, oh, I was duped. I can't believe that happened. And, you know, I'm going to distance myself from these groups or I'm not going to participate in that anymore. And then give it another couple years. And then the next person comes along, like you said, who has a platform and 
suddenly they're gaining traction. Everybody wants to interview them on their podcast and YouTube channels. And it, it's the same. It's just a different person, maybe a different subject, but it's the same red flags. It's the same mm -hmm. patterns. And I, I'm seeing it actually happen right now. I won't go into detail with that, but it it just, I'm seeing it right now. And yes. I was saying to a friend the other day, it's happening again, but just completely different people and topics. And, uh, but, but there, there we go. And there's lots of people who are kind of going through that same process of, oh, should this be someone I follow? Kind of the, you know, the things that they're promoting right now, it's a little off with, with what we're taught in the gospel of the church or with the doctrine, but it's interesting. So I'm going to keep going down that trail. I'm going to keep following those breadcrumbs. And then they get more curious, more interested, and then it just kind of pulls them in. Then we see because the storyline or or what they're saying, the narrative sounds so good. Yes. And, and the narrative fits with LDS things of of what we know in the last days or what we've been told, what the scriptures teach. Yes. But you know that a true servant will always point you to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. They don't go and bring attention to themselves and say, this is what I've done, or this is this. They share experiences and they say, you know, this is what I have learned through the spirit. It, it doesn't matter if you have things that you can say or that you can prove who you are. A true spirit of the Lord will always send those to Jesus Christ and your heavenly father. And I think that's the most important thing that I have learned is always rely on your heavenly father. If you want to follow somebody, follow yeah. the savior. Amen. You know, another, um, um, something I was just thinking about right now, I guess you could just call it a red flag. It's, it's a pattern I see with all of these stories and all of these groups and people is that there tends to be sort of like a chip on their shoulder, kind of like a bitterness towards the church or someone in the church or a doctrine in the church or just something along those lines to where everything sounds good. And then all of a sudden you trigger them with something and then you see it and it's like, well, <laughs> actually, you know, I'm not okay with that. Or this person is out of line and um, let's not talk about that. Or you can just sense this chip on their shoulder, this bitterness. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a true servant of Christ uh, is, is not going to have that anger, hatred, bitterness, there's going to be peace and yeah. understanding and, and love and kindness and all of those yeah. attributes of the savior. Do you agree? I do agree because in the book of Mormon at the very end, when Moroni is seeing the downfall of the whole Nephite nation, he talks about a peaceful walk. This is where we need to be. It, it doesn't matter what's going on around you if the downfall happens he's still talking about a peaceful walk and that i feel like is where we need to be but what i see is a lot of these people who have risen up and saying i'm this or i'm that a lot of them have come from a place of hurt yeah and need to be healed themselves mm -hmm. and they need to find a way to feel special and in a way to heal them but in return, what is the intent of their heart? Mm -hmm. You get to have the opportunity to discern what the intent of people's heart is. And I think that is the lesson that we get to learn and that we're practicing is learning to discern between right and wrong, truth and error and dark and light. And these things are brought about. And I, I believe that we need the spirit of the Lord to help us to do that. And we need to be praying for that and that discernment, because there are so many things that are rising up where you can go into this path or that path, but is it really a path that you should be going? Yeah. It's, it's important to stay close to, to God or your creator to be able to do that and to get things verified and I know that he verifies those things for us. He loves us mm -hmm. for we are his children. Yes. And he wants us to be safe. And um, there is that guidance and that help for us and that we can have answers to prayers. I know when I had did an interview with somebody else before, somebody said, oh, she thinks she's so special because she thinks she can talk to God and God will answer her. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> I do think I'm special. Yeah. And I think everybody else is special too. Right. And everybody 
God loves everybody the same. Yes. We are his children. And, and yes, he does answer them. And each one of us have this, this plan, this marvelous plan. And according, according to him, how things are supposed to be. Right. But it's up to us to be able to discern. And so that's the thing that I have found is the most important thing as I have been through this, because I've walked through the darkness before in my own way mm -hmm. of, of allowing myself to be away from my creator. But I've also <laughs> walked through the darkness with some of these people not knowing. Yes. But somebody knew. Mm -hmm. And somebody kept me safe. Mm -hmm. And although not everybody was able to be kept safe, I know that everybody has a plan. Mm -hmm. And whatever that plan is, our creator knows. And we are in his hands. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. As, as long as we stay close to him and our hearts are drawn close to him, we will stand in the holy place where we need to be. Mm -hmm. And that is the most important thing we can do, in my opinion, from my experiences. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You, you talk about discernment, and I think that is so important right now. I know there's probably people who will be listening to this who maybe have had questions before, you know, how do I trust my discernment? Um, and, and I'll just give a quick example. I, I did a whole video about this years ago about my some of my experiences where I um, met some pretty interesting groups and experienced firsthand some pretty crazy things. Saw a lot of darkness and things I don't ever want to repeat. <laughs> just like, you know, completely caught off guard by that, but eventually um, was able to recognize that and distance myself and Kind of warn other people. I mean, I, I, I've even experienced groups who, similar to this case, led to the death of people who people who I know their their family members, people they care about, were killed and died and didn't have to, didn't have to die that way, but did because of their associations with these groups and what they were participating in. And so I've seen it. So I know I know how cunning the adversary is. I know his tactics. I've seen how he just starts with these little innocent things that just seem fine. And then it just kind of builds from there. And then people are just completely blinded. Yes. And so people have said to me, well, you know, you, you say you have discernment, but you yourself, you know, um, went to some of these conferences or events or groups or meetings or whatnot years ago. And, you know, you felt led to go to those. And I look back at that and I say, I did. <laughs> and now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's it's like um elder holland has shared before that experience where um he was in the truck with his i think it was his father and they there was a fork in the road and they prayed about it and they felt that they should go to the right so they went to the right drove all the way down that road and there was a dead end and um he said well we prayed about it i don't understand why we felt good about going that way when it clearly was the wrong way and his father said, sometimes the Lord will let you go far enough down a road to realize it's the wrong way. So you really have, have assurance that the other path is the right way. Yeah. And that was my experience. So what would you say to anyone out there listening who says, how can you trust your discernment? Or if my discernment has, you know, I've, I've been wrong about things before with my own judgment. How can I trust going forward that something's right and something's wrong? How do I know? What would you say? Sometimes we think that we can pray about things and that we can get our answer. And if I can say anything, it's what a native medicine man told me. He said to check, 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 be in tune with your creator enough to ask three times and see if you get the same answer because you can't wear, wear God out. He, he will let you know. And so if we are if we are going by a feeling and we go by that feeling, we still have that that freedom to feel like we did or that agency to feel. But to be more in tune and to check, it's it's having that relationship with him and asking three times. There's something very powerful about the number three and yeah. asking. And when you when you get that, then you know that you can move forward with faith and hope and go in the right direction. And so that's kind of the things that I've learned through this process. And sometimes I think we go through processes so we can actually share that information or our experiences with other people 
-hmm. and be able to help them in a way. So that's actually what my book, I feel like will help people with. There is a pattern in there as far as ancient things that happen that the adversary uses different patterns as far as secret societies and secret combinations go. And so I bring that up a little bit in the book and what the spirit has taught me about that. And so there's so much in that book where there'll be a question asked and then the spirit will say, well, look at this or look at that. And, and I've seen things by the spirit. And so it's just kind of guided me through this process, but actually it's actually helped me to see that that secret combination Mm -hmm. was going on behind Mm -hmm. the scenes and being able to point that out so that people know what those secret combinations are. And I think that the Book of Mormon shares a lot about that and brings that up out to life. But I don't know if these two, Chad and Lori, really knew that they were going by a secret combination Mm -hmm. and acting out a secret combination. But from what I've seen, looking back, looking at all the information and my own experiences, that's indeed what it was. Oh, for sure. And look what it led to. Yes. And it's sad that it was. That's a that's a good point. I know a lot of people have wondered about that. They've wondered, okay, now at this point, uh, where we're at with with the trial and everything, how far we've come with this. At this point, as they're sitting there in their cell, what are they thinking? Are they finally realizing, hey, I think I was deceived. I think now that I look back, somewhere things went wrong. Or is it more like, you know what? There, no one's ever going to understand me. You know, I, I, I guess I just have to go through this trial, but I'm still in the right. I still know that this is what I was supposed to do. What are your thoughts about that? I think that sometimes, let's take Cain, for instance. Uh Um, He knew that he was supposed to, um, the adversary told him to make an offering to the Lord. And the adversary knew why, Mm -hmm. but Cain didn't. And he made an offering to the Lord and it wasn't acceptable. In a way, Satan knew what was going to happen at that time. And so from that time on, it was this process of going down this road little bit by little bit until he got Cain to enter into this agreement. Mm -hmm. Then he killed Abel. And after that point, he went crazy. He had taken everything out of him that was good. And sometimes when we go through these descents, that's what happens. Everything that was good for us is taken away and you don't have that compass inside of you or the spirit to lead and guide you as much because of the decisions you make. So it's very important for us to guard ourselves, feel feel that peace inside. Are we having that personal peace? Are there things that we need to be doing? Are there things that we shouldn't be doing to be able to keep that peaceful walk with us? When we know that we're in that peaceful walk, we have a better chance of staying closer to our creator and not being deceived, but always important to ask and have things verified. Uh, It's very tragic for me to see Chad Mm -hmm. the day that I went to his Um, trial for the one day and to be able to look at him and see he wasn't the same man that I knew and I know it was hard and I know that people want justice done and I know there's a lot of people that are angry but it also made me sad to Mm -hmm. see this this friend and acquaintance that I knew um, not be the person he was yeah and that's where it takes you that's a really good point because I think a lot of times we can get caught up in all of the, just joining in with everybody else, you know, we're so angry or how could this happen? Or this is horrible. What a horrible person. But we have to realize that this is still a child of God. This is still somebody who is is loved by his creator, by, by his father. And it's hard to do. It takes a lot to be able to do that, to be able to look at someone through that lens and have that compassion. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what? It's 
I, I feel like that's key in forgiveness. It's key in your own healing is when you can look through everything from that perspective of how their father sees them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. For and, you know, I think that's going to be, take a long time for everybody. Yeah. But I, I know that there's things that people can learn from this mm -hmm. and it has been so hard and tragic on the victims' families and my heart goes out to them and I just want them to know that they are acknowledged and that they are loved. Um, I think it's very hard when people who have been involved in this case don't acknowledge that they're wrong. Yes. And I have seen the hurt from the victims' families because they haven't been acknowledged in that way. But a lot of them have turned and um, went against actually what they were in. Yep. And it was just not not um, acknowledging that maybe they were in the wrong as well. You know, yeah. I'd say they were in the wrong. What they acted out and what they played out was a horrific thing, what they were involved in. There was witchcraft. There was secret combinations. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be a hard lesson for learning and a hard pill to swallow for a lot of them. Yeah. And it's sad that they're in that predicament because that's something that they have to live with the rest of their life. When you said that, it reminded me of the case, um, the YouTuber mom from Utah. Frankie. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and, how, and yeah. yeah. And when that came out, um, just the difference, the contrast between how she responded after her case in court versus watching the Chad and Lori Daybell case, there was just such a difference there, how she just admitted, I was in the wrong, this was not good, and I I deserve this, I deserve to be here, I feel horrible, I think it was very genuine, I, I think most people felt that it was genuine, would you agree, did you get that feeling, or um, no? To a certain extent, yeah. I think it was, but to a certain extent, I feel like her lawyer just like Chad's lawyer knew how to run the system and what would be better for her in that way. I think a lot of people when they have a heart can feel a little bit grievous about things, but I, I feel like too, that she was coached with her, with her lawyer, that there's things that she needed to say. And, and probably looking back at it now, she, she probably has it in her heart to see what damage she caused She's one that could look at herself when she was behind bars and maybe censor herself and see, where did I go wrong? What did I do? Even her moral compass, she she talks about her moral moral place, how it was not right where it should be. Yeah. And when you allow that to go, everything else goes with it. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe this will just be a moment for her. Maybe that just got the ball rolling for her to now have all this time to really ponder that. And yeah. it's just a long process, just a slow yeah. process. But I, I wonder, I often wonder how Chad and Lori, what they think about when they're in there, because yeah. I, I feel like when I went to his court that he was so, un, how do I put it? Kind of like. Numb or just not void? Like, that, like, like everything good was taken out of him. Everything good. He allowed his kids to, to testify and, you know, now they get to face the public with what they've said. And, and I think that's sad and they've, they've lost both their mother and their father. When you lose everything like that, you're not yourself and you can't be yourself and you don't, you don't hunger for things of, of the spirit of, of truth anymore. Yeah. And and it's a horrible place to be in. It's yeah. really a horrible place to be in. I was trying to do that myself. I was trying to look back on my experiences with Chad and just notice the difference between 2008 when I first met him up until now. And um, I don't know. I, I have to say, I, I guess I didn't know him well enough to, to know a really good side of him. My experience was just uh, with, with the business, with the publishing company, everything went wrong, everything went south and they filed for bankruptcy. And there was a lot of messy situations involved in that. And it was not a pleasant experience for any of their authors. So that's what I experienced. 
but the times that we did talk and meet in person and whatnot, he seemed like a, a nice, normal person. He seemed, uh, you know, he had a sense of humor. He smiled. He he seemed just like a normal guy, just a normal guy next door. And so I remember over the years, I think when I saw him at one of the conferences where um, one of his authors spoke, and I won't go into to all that, you do talk about her in the book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You've changed your name though, of course. And I just remember watching what went down with that. I had a booth. I was selling, I, I have a product called Hydro Heal. It's a foot cream. Well, it's mm-hmm creams and I had a table set up with my sister we were selling the product and his booth was right next to me and so we had a lot of opportunities to see each other and kind of talk and I remember when his author she was the keynote speaker that day at this particular conference so everybody had come to see her speak so everyone gathered into this room and she never spoke she never delivered her message because she was under attack Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean yeah. I don't know what was going on, but she, instead they had the whole room pray and sing hymns. And this went on for like 40 minutes and then they hauled her away and brought her back. And so they were giving her blessings and what sounded like exorcisms or something like it was really bizarre. I can't remember all the details of, of what I was told was going on behind the scenes. It just, it almost became like entertainment. Like people were just kind of like, what is going on? It's like a circus show. It's yeah gone. There was no message. What is this about? And then after that, people just left kind of feeling uneasy. And a lot of people kind of parted ways that day. I think it was a way to kind of um, sift people to say, hey, you know, you're going to keep getting more of this. This is not what you what you want. Um, But we were there to sell my product. And we sold a lot of product. So I was like, well, that's good. But at the same time, it was another eye-opening experience for me to see what was really going on with these groups and people and Chad. That was when I saw a different side of him I had not seen before. And it just made me reflect back on our past experiences to to see, hey, where have things gone differently? (laughs) Was he always like this? You know, what other authors was he supporting or, or publishing? You know, what's going on here? And then just, I guess, just to add to that, it reminded me when I was looking back on our past experiences, when he published my book, the one thing that was great that I loved about it was he got it into all the bookstores. He got it into Desert Book. He got it into bookstores all over the nation. And then I went and and promoted my own book tour. I invested my own money into my own media tour. I just, I went all across the country and did interviews, but I paid for that myself. And my very first one was a local radio station here in Utah. And I was so excited to be able to go on. And he called me and he said, hey, when you go into that interview and if they ask you if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, do not give them an answer. Do not bring up religion because it has nothing to do with your book. Your book is about marriage. It's how to date your spouse. So don't talk about religion. Don't go down those pathways. Just avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. And I felt really strange about that because I thought, I don't know, (laughs) because I feel like if someone genuinely asks me that question, I shouldn't be afraid to give an honest answer and, and share my light. And so actually that did come up. It came up live on the radio. The DJ, the host of the show asked me, so you're from Utah. Are you a member of the church? And I remember feeling so awkward. And I said, I'm not allowed to answer that question. Can we talk? Can we move on to the next question? And he said, what? (laughs) You're not allowed to answer that. And I was like, oh, what's going on? This is going horribly wrong. And because of that wrong answer that Chad had asked me to give, it changed the whole tone of our interview. And things just got really weird. And instead of focusing on the book, the host was now focused on probing me and getting me to talk about why I didn't want to talk about that. And I just remember wishing I could go back and just not listen to his advice. And every ounce of advice he ever gave me was not good advice. (laughs) And then he went bankrupt. I bought all my rights back and started doing it on my own. And then things went well. Um, So, (laughs) so looking back, that was my experience. From your encounters with Chad, your experiences with him, were there ever things similar to that where he shared things with you or gave you suggestions or told you things that you just felt were off? You didn't feel right about it. And maybe you uh, went along with it for a while and then realized that was not, that was not right. 
do you want to share? I think you knew not to share with things with me. <laughs> yes. Okay. And the reason why I say that, because there's a part in my book that's called, that's a very spiritual book. And I had written a book, I think in 2015 called Sleepwalking, Waking Up to the Possibilities Through Christ. And I had BYU publish that for me. And we were at the Dreams and Visions event up in in Brigham, Brigham City. And he was there. And we were talking about about books and publishing books. And and I had told him, I well, I wrote a book. And he's like, You did? And I said, Yeah. And um, I told him the name of it. And he's like, and and I have this in my book, but I'm giving some of it away. <laughs> um <laughs> He, he said to me, have you ever thought about getting it republished? And I, I kind of knew where he was going with this because I knew that at that point that his publishing company was struggling. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, well, yeah, I, I think about that. And so he's like, send me a copy of it and I'll, I'll read it and see, you know, what I think. And so I sent him an email of it. And then the next time I saw him, I was so excited. I was like, so what'd you think about my book? And he, he looked at me and he's like, well, that's a very spiritual book. <laughs> Nothing else. That was it. What? Oh my goodness. And in my mind, I'm thinking, but that's what I thought you liked. Right. So apparently it was too spiritual. I think he knew at mm -hmm. that point that. I probably would not be on his number system list as the person being full of light. <laughs> I'd be like a 4D. <laughs> I can handle that. that. A 4D, I'm sure I would be. <laughs> so oh, anyway, that that's okay. Eventually, right? <laughs> like, Take that's it okay if I'm dubbed 4D by Chad. I'm all right with that. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think he knew. I think he knew that I was spiritually inclined enough, in, in my opinion. That's yeah. what I feel happened. Yeah. And because I was friends with Melanie Gibb and Audrey Baratario, Audrey was one of the lightest ones. You know, she was the biggest one in between Chad and Lori that, you know, the friend. And and at the time, I didn't even know this, but she was the one that was the most light. And so being friends with them, but yet not knowing what was really happening, like I said, was was very shocking to me. But looking back now, I'm very grateful. I would have been dubbed probably a 4D. Yeah. 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 But I wasn't close enough. Looking back now, I'm also grateful that I didn't live in the same state as, mm -hmm. as they did and had that close, close relationship. But I did notice at one time that all of them got really close mm -hmm. and I didn't understand it, but I do now. Yeah, so that makes sense now. It, it was, it was very different to see that. And I thought, what's, what's really going on here, you know? And then I knew that I wasn't, I was friends with them, but not with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was okay for me because something felt off or something that didn't feel right. And it was a little uncomfortable, like, like it felt like being part of this click, I guess you can say if you were a teenager, okay, you know, yeah. part of this click, but, but feeling like you're not part. Yeah. But really didn't know what the extent of that click really meant. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess you could say, thank goodness though, you were that kind of third wheel because you spared yourself from having to be a part of even more that you might not want to, you know, to have been a part of. So, well, I, I just remember I was, I, I was looking forward to the first preparing a people conference in Arizona. And this is the one that Melanie was putting on and I was told not to go. I really wanted to go. I had my hotel and, and everything. And yet I know I, I have it in my book because I have a, a very good friend of mine at the time who was very spiritually gifted and she came over like two or three days before I was going to go and mm -hmm. told me not to go. I was going to meet, you know, my former husband out there and, and be there with, with my friends and, yeah. and, you know, and just have a good time. And, and I asked why I can't go. And 
she goes, I, I don't know something about your safety. And I really had to think and ponder about that and think about, well, my safety, you know, what, what was with that, even though I didn't know somebody knew. Yes. Absolutely. And my job was to go to God and get it verified. And so I did. I I went to God and I said, you know, is is there a reason why I shouldn't go? Can I go? And and I got the answer was no, that I should not go. And because I, I could have just went, but I know that somebody knew better than me. And because I got it verified, I I stayed home. I think that's where um, Lori was at, but it just seemed like of all the times that we had all these conferences and different things, her and I were not meant to cross paths. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but it, it just ended up being that way. One time as close as I was to Melanie Gibb and as close as Melanie Gibb was to her, there still was not that, that path that was crossed. Wow. So somebody yeah. was really watching out for you, making sure that did not happen. Yeah. Yeah, I look at it now and I, I it, it's very clear to me that's how it was meant to be. Yeah, it seems like everyone who eventually did cross paths with her paid for it in one way or another. I know mm -hmm. you talk about witchcraft in your book. You mentioned it a little bit in this interview already. Uh, do you feel that that was something she was knowingly or unknowingly involved in? I know there were people also in her circle who were knowingly involved in that. Because I think sometimes people intentionally get involved in that. They know that's what that is. It's darkness and they they choose that. And then other people think, oh, this is innocent. I have, uh, I can justify my reasons and this is fine. good intentions. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say. What are your thoughts about that with, with her? My personal opinion, this is me and I, I can't diagnose, but she's already been diagnosed. But that's true. coming from a spiritual side of things, I do what's called like your walk in beauty. Your walk in beauty is being physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally balanced. And that is the Navajo way of healing or I, you should say the Diné, um, yes. we're called the Diné. Everybody knows us by the Navajo, right. but it's being physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally balanced. So when one of those are out, then you're not walking in your beauty. Mm -hmm. And so what I've seen with her is she's been diagnosed with that delusion disorder. And sometimes spiritually, the darkness can take that and use it and make it look like you're doing things of light. And, you know, she was going to the temple. She was doing all that. But I think when she met Chad, those two together um, were not good for each other spiritually. Yeah. There was something very out and very wrong with each one of them from the beginning, but they chose to go down that path. Yes. And the manipulation is something I feel like from what I've seen, like Lori's cousin, Megan Connor, who knew her best, yeah. talked about her and how she she was and the kind of personality she was. Mm -hmm. And then seeing Chad and his background and then seeing these two meet was just very devastating for a lot of people, a lot of people. Because of that, the toxicity, that that side effect of that negative energy just like a, like a like a bomb just went out and um devastated a lot of people but i think a lot of people that were around them because they talked good chad was on a vow and he was going and talking to different different people but you know there's a difference between talking and there's a difference between speaking with the spirit Yes. And when you're speaking with the spirit, it uplifts people and points them to Christ. Yeah. Um, there's good messages that people bring, but there's also those that, that are given by the spirit to uplift people. And again, that's another, another thing of discernment that people need to know is there's, there's things that are, are good messages, but there's those that if you're going to look into putting your energy, make sure it's something that's verified through the spirit of the Lord. That's yeah. very important. 
But I think that a lot of the people that were around Lori, like especially these these women, um, Melanie Gibb and and um, Audrey and a lot of the others, I, I just say their name because these are the ones that I knew, thought that they were doing something good. Yeah. And they they saw that Lori was going to the temple every day and she was getting this and she was saying Jesus told her, but there's always red flags too. Mm-hmm. If Jesus is telling you to do something on another child of God that is causing them misery, mm-hmm. maybe you better step back and think a little bit because mm-hmm. that is not what Jesus Christ taught. Absolutely. Is to put people through misery like that. Okay. You said something that now we're going to get to your book. Cause I, I bookmarked some pages in there. That was one of the pages. Um, you have a, a section in your book titled, I think it's not the Lord's way. Can you expand on that a little more? Cause you just kind of brought it up right now. What do you, what do you mean when you say not the Lord's way? I mean, I, I know I, I read that part, but I just for the viewers out there, not the Lord's way is knowing the Lord. Mm-hmm. It's, it's learning of him is learning from him. It's having that relationship with him. And when you get to that point, then you know that your life and those who are true servants of the Lord will emulate that through their life. Mm -hmm. And if that's not emulated through the, the life that Christ lived or what he taught, then you better be seriously be thinking about that. And that's why I call that, that's not, not the Lord's way. It wasn't, it wasn't the way that the Lord did things. And, and I bring up Charles in that because of, of what she did Mm -hmm. to him. She, um, she made him suffer. She took everything away from him and before, before she had him killed and made him be in fear and said, Jesus told her to do that. That's not the Lord's way. The Lord taught love. Mm-hmm. He he healed his the children. He he was a peaceful person. So for her to say the Lord did that, I don't think that she was speaking to the right Lord. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> yeah. Because there are those also, and it talks about in the scriptures that come and look like they are spirits of light or they are of light and that's really where you need to start checking things Mm -hmm. and really really know within yourself that inner compass and again what we had talked about before knowing knowing your creator your heavenly father or the lord and knowing that way and and walking in that path that path because that is the most important thing that path will keep you safe absolutely That's so true. I I found myself saying that very sentence so many times, that phrase, not the Lord's way throughout all of my experiences. And so that stood out to me when you wrote that. I was like, I always said that I would, I would witness something really off putting and I would come home and talk to my husband and I would say, that's not the Lord's way. I don't want anything to do with that. That is not the Lord's way. And I think just like what you said, you're only going to know the Lord's way if you know the Lord. If you have that relationship with him and you've studied his word and you know who he really is, you'll recognize that that is not his way. That's not how he does things. It's not how he operates. Well, I think some people can say the last questions and and they'll say, well, I think God would do this, or I think God would do this and this and this, and they speak for God. And I found that a lot, but when you know him, you can recognize if it's the Lord's way or not, it's not yeah. just speaking for him and saying, well, I think he would do this or this or this. And a lot of that is they're speaking for God in the understanding of man's way. It's not the spiritual connection that you have with him. And that's the most important thing is that relationship that you have. Absolutely. And then you know, it's not the Lord's way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's been verified through the spirit that it's not the Lord's way. <laughs> it's a given. It yeah. will never, it'll never lead you astray. Uh, you know, that's a good point too, because I, you talk about this, you mentioned a little of, about this today in our interview, how some people uh, like Chad, 
you know, maybe they just have, they feel like they have an average life. Things are not exciting. They're not excited with their relationships or their marriage or, you know, their role in the, in their community or their job or their calling at church, whatever it is, they're looking for something that will help them feel special and excited and important. And that's kind of where it starts. And then when people give them that applause and that mm -hmm. attention, it just kind of escalates from there. But what you just said is key because if you have a relationship with the Lord, you you already feel special. You already feel valuable. You feel needed when you know your identity, you understand who you are, why you're here, and you get a lot of that from your patriarchal blessing. And when you when you follow that compass, you, you feel that. You don't need it from other people to be like, hey, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're amazing. You already know that. You have that peace. And I think that's the difference too between the Lord's way and the adversary's way is with the Lord, you, you feel peace. You feel mm -hmm. like I don't have to do anything. It's the Lord doing everything. I'm just an instrument. I'm, he's just exactly. telling me where to serve, where to be, what to do, where with the adversary, it's like, no, you get the honor. You get the glory. This is all about you. You're doing this. And the Lord is just amazed with you. And, and, um, you just keep doing what you're doing. Cause you know, it's, it's amazing. And it becomes more about you. It's that's the other thing too. You talk about patterns in here, something I had always noticed, which you talk about, which I think is a part of that whole world of, uh, secret combinations and whatnot is, is selfishness. It always becomes all about the person, like, you know, what's in it for me? What can I gain from this? It's never about other people and putting yourself aside to just serve behind the scenes without the spotlight, just loving people and helping them. Do you want to add anything to that? Because I know you talk a lot about that in your book. I think it's very true. Um, our native teaching is, the scriptures call it like being a vessel of the Lord. Our native teaching is the hollow bone. And this is one thing that I always knew, and especially being associated with these groups that I didn't see, that at some of the end of these conferences, I noticed, and it really bothered me, that people would go and they would buy all this stuff, but they were they were looking up to these people who claimed to have spiritual experiences and all these things. And and there were good people there. I, I must acknowledge that there were good people there with good intent, wanted to teach some, but there were also some there that liked the spotlight, that liked to draw attention to themselves, that they were claiming that they were somebody they were not. And getting people to admire them. And it's those followings that I saw. I saw that preparing the people wanted to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. That was their intent. That's what they shared with me. That's what they wanted. But a lot of these people were putting Chad and, and Lori, according to what state you lived in, um, on this pedestal. and. It was, it was like a form of admiration. And so at the end of these conferences, it, it was, it was disgusting for me. I felt disgusted <laughs> because in the native way, we have the teaching of the hollow bone, which is you are, you are the bone and you clean yourself out of the most marrow. So the most power of our creator can run through you. Wow. You are that hollow bone. And you know, and especially being a healer, mm -hmm. you know that power is not yours. Mm -hmm. That comes from the creator. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the Book of Mormon, it talks about Christ. I am the light and the life of the world. It's his light and it's his life. And there was a reason why he was called the master when he was here. Mm -hmm. He was the master of everything. And we are that hollow bone that that light, if we choose, can be used for the power of God to run through us. I love that. That's one thing that I see that these people totally dismissed and did not see, that they were not the vessels of the Lord. They were not, as far as them wanting to gather for the Lord and do that, that's what they wanted to do. But the end result went awry. Because yeah. it was too much of ego mm -hmm. and not enough of 
being a servant of the Lord and what would thou have me do? Right. Absolutely. It was, it was being admired by people. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people in the public eye that still do that. Yeah. It's like, they can say, well, they can claim I am this person and I am that. And yet I can show you this, but I think the hang up is, is we, as people know, and I know there's a lot of, a lot of churches that teach this too, about the last days and the book of revelations and how we see some things coming about, mm -hmm. but there are people rising up now. And just because you're native or just because you're this person and you claim to be this person and you see that it coincides with, with last days, then we all of a sudden want to jump in hook, line and sinker. Yes. But we don't ask. And that's going to be our downfall if we don't, because it's so important because it's like this maze of discernment that we're trying to get through. Yes. But if we hold on to that light and life of the world, that's what's going to get us through this maze. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the spirit of the Lord that's going to help us. And I think a lot of the prophets and, and the scriptures teach us that, you yeah. know, we, we won't be able to make it without that. And I, I, I see how that is, is coming about a lot. We need to be more vigilant in that. Absolutely. You couldn't have said that any better. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You talked about how you went through a little bit of that. You went through some spiritual darkness in your life. You talk about the time where you were disfellowshipped from the church. What was that like coming back, comparing the, the contrast of coming back to how it was when you were leaving, you were on your way out. Can you com compare that contrast and then we can kind of apply it nowadays in this day with everything going on around us? You know, a lot of people will look and look at, um, being excommunicated as a horrible thing. And for me, it was the most amazing experience that I could have went through. I know what it feels like to have the adversary say, well, you can do this. You can handle it. Oh, you can do this. This is okay. You know, you, you're still going to be okay. And, and I did, I, I followed that little bait to ride along until all of a sudden I found myself spiritually dead. That is a horrible place to be. It wasn't at the very beginning because at the very beginning, it was like, oh, you know, you're partaking of, of that, what the scriptures term the great and spacious building. Mm -hmm. And you're in this great and spacious building and it's all great and you're, you're partying and you're having a good time. And then it's like the prodigal son, you come to yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a point where you come to yourself and then you realize you are far different than where you were and what that felt like. Mm -hmm. And so coming to yourself in that process, it, it got to the point where it was all fun and games. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I am not at peace. There's only one person who can give you that peace. And that is our, our creator. And so when you're off doing these things, of of the world and having this good time and partaking in the stuff your heart gets hardened you get a blindness of mind and you don't see like you're supposed to mm -hmm. and then you start seeing it's all about me yeah and then you realize especially for me I got angry so quick and I was opinionated and I just wanted to tell people my opinion and I it didn't matter what what my actions made somebody feel and that's, I don't think people really realize that when they lose that inner, inner guidance or that inner compass, they're not truly themselves and they can't be. And they let the adversary or the darkness rule over them. Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of like in chains of bondage. Yeah, you're and not you're, free. <laughs> you're, and you're not yourself and, and you can't be. And so there got to be a point where I did come to myself and then it was a scary process for me mm -hmm. because it was like, if I died today, I felt like knowing my spirit and what I have done and where I wasn't at the time, Yes, it would be a scary place for me Wow, because I didn't feel like I could, I didn't feel like I could look at my savior mm -hmm. and have him tell me 
well done, thou good and faithful servant. That was scary to me. And so it was a process. And as this process happened, the adversary was right there. Oh, no, you can't do this. You know, you might, you might mess up. You you don't want to do that. You might mess up here. You know, you can't do that. But it got to the point where I desired that peace Mm -hmm. more than anything. And um, when I turned back to the Lord, it was very sweet. I put in one of my books, it was the day where I saw him take this hurt lamb and put it on his shoulders and heal me. And I'm grateful for that. I know because of the experiences that I've been through that I can actually help others, let them know how it feels to feel that way. But sometimes we have to go through that process of that darkness, of walking through that darkness to be strengthened more in the light. And that is the most important thing is growing in that light and having that peace with you that only the Savior can give you. And it was just an amazing time to to come back and and know that the atonement had taken a most active part in my life that I had ever cause the savior to go through extremes for me and someday i know when i see him face to face that i will still not understand everything but i will understand at that time that he is literally the savior of this world because he saved me and i think we have to go through that process I I pray for some of these people that have been involved in this case and how um, hard it's been for some of them and for for their healing on all levels, whatever that is, either the victimizers or the victims, because whether they're the victimizers or the victims, the Lord paid the price for both of them. And that I do know. And it's it's just the processes of what we get to learn and grow from. So, Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, you actually answered my very last question. (laughs) I love how that works. That is perfect because we are out of time. Um, Is there any last thing you want to say? Just know you are loved and you are special and God loves you. And whatever you do here, even if it's just a smile for somebody, you're doing something great and bringing light into the world. So go out and just be yourself because that's all God requires. So. Thank you, Janelle. You're awesome. You're the best. (laughs) I do want to thank you for for agreeing to coming on today and doing this interview and sharing with everyone in such a public way, your own personal experiences. I know that can be not the funnest thing to do sometimes, but I always, I always learn that there's, there's always somebody out there who needs to hear that message. It always helps just one person. And if you can just help one person Yes. More can you ask for, for the Lord? Exactly. I feel that as well. (laughs) I I just know, I I personally am grateful for your testimony and and what you've shared. And I know there will be others who feel the same. So thank you, Janelle, for your sweet spirit, for being brave to come Ah. on, share your message. And And thank you for having me. I appreciate it so very much. Thank you. Um, For those of you, again, who are would like to check out her book. It's called Walking Through the Doomsday Darkness as I've Seen It by Janelle Murphy. And you can get this on Amazon. I'll have a link to it down below in the video description. Also, a portion of each book sale will go towards the Tammy Douglas Daybell Foundation, a foundation that helps children love to read. I appreciate that. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Do you suffer from dry, itchy, flaky skin? Tired of wasting money on products that don't work? Hi, I'm Lindsay Reach, the creator of Hydro Heal, a product that's been changing dry skin for almost two decades. I created Hydro Heal back in 2008 as a solution for my own dry feet. Countless pedicures and dermatologist visits weren't making a difference. And who has the time or energy for this method? Word on the street spread and Hydro Heal gained the attention of Shark Tank investors and venture capitalists 
launching it on a nationwide TV campaign, gaining interest and attention from celebrities on live TV. See it to believe it demos and try before you buy? Put Hydro Hill in the spotlight, selling out of product at every show. After my feet were transformed, I decided to test it on eczema, dry lips and hands, athlete's foot, and cradle cap. And the results were incredible. Brand new skin in just seven days. But it gets even better. Hydro Hill was also tested on a recovering hospital patient with an ongoing leg wound that would not close. After three days, this was the result. A wound that closed, healthy skin, and doctors were amazed. So how does Hydro Hill work? It's a solid ointment made from natural ingredients that turns into a liquid on contact with your skin, seeping down into deep cracks while acting like a bandage, creating an invisible barrier on the surface, protecting your skin from outside elements, allowing it to naturally repair from the inside out. Start feeling more comfortable in your skin today because everyone should love their skin. Click down below for a special offer or visit hydrohill.com.